Well, welcome to another podcast. Uh, today we have a special guest, David L. Bonson, and he has written a new book. And what's the title of your book, sir? Full Time Work and the Meaning of Life. Great. So, what motivated you to write this book? I think that over the last several years, it become increasingly apparent to me that not only was the way our society thinks about and relates to work, but that the church itself was increasingly adopting a more negative view of work. I think that uh, I've been in the evangelical church my whole life. I've heard a hundred sermons about work, and all of them were warning against people working too much. And uh, very rarely am I hearing people preaching about the need for more achievement, more ambition, more productivity in the workforce. And then it was really out of that COVID moment where the society decided to tell everyone to stay home for a while. A lot of people didn't come back to work right. afterwards. Lo and behold, all of a sudden we're facing this crisis of loneliness and a purposelessness. And I said, well, you know, I think these things might be connected. So I took my passions for my own work and career and tried to apply it to a broader theological message. Wow, that's great. <laughs> you know, one of the things that stood out after COVID once COVID started, everyone's locked down. And then kind of at the end, guys were just kind of violating the lockdowns and doing their thing, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I go to this place in, uh, by the beach, and it's a cliff, and it's overlooking all the surfers. And there's surfers. This place is just packed. Well, now it's time to go back to work. And the surf population is not going down. It's growing. Yeah. Still. And there's, there's guys my age out there surfing. Yeah. And I go, I don't think they're going back to work ever. They said, this vacation, I'm liking it. And I'm never going back if I can avoid it. That's what it appeared to me. So I think you nailed it. Uh, so what is the primary message that you want people to take away from your book? Well, I think, of course, it's a little different based on the audience. Um, you know, at, at a high level, I want people to think of work that it matters to God in the way I believe it matters to God. And uh, that might have a different practical application to a 25-year-old than it does a 65-year-old. But fundamentally, I think it's really important to understand that God created us to be workers. And we, as Christians, are very fond of saying things that are true that I don't think we know what they really mean. Right. We've always said we're made in the image of God. Mm -hmm. That's true. We're made in the likeness of God. It's true. Mm -hmm. But saying we were made, what that means is that God made us to co-create with him well, now all of a sudden that begs for a little more explanation, a little more understanding. Right. The main takeaway I want people to have is that inherent to our being as humans, it, our, our work may not be the entirety of our identity, but it is part of it. And this idea that what we do is totally separate from who we are is simply untrue. And so while I recognize the work is not the only component of our identity, it is a component of our identity. And I want us to take that seriously as we go about building the kingdom of God. That makes great sense. And when we talk about the kingdom of God, we're talking about God's dominion on the earth being expressed through human behavior. That's right. Right? It starts internally, but it has to affect the physical world around us. It does. And and it could be um, in activities. It could be in institutions. Um, it, 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 I think we have too small of a view of kingdom. And then, of course, there's the, the issue that just it's part of a process. Right. And so much like work, you don't build a business and on day one, you're Microsoft or on day one, you're exactly. Amazon. It's incremental. And, and so that incrementalism, which I think applies to so many aspects of Christian living, it applies to the way we should view work as well. Oh, great. Here's my next question. Uh, it'll help me a lot. It, how does the creation mandate relate to the gospel mandate? Or in other words, do you see the gospel mandate as a subset of the creation mandate or vice versa? Or do you see one as an extension of the other? Or how would you explain the relationship between the two fundamental missions given to man or Christians? Yeah, and so this really requires a little bit of Christian theology, right? It does, uh, the Great Commission in Matthew doesn't make sense if we don't understand the gospel. And so what is the gospel? It is the fact that God provided a, me a mechanism, a means of justifying us and then sanctifying us back to him, a restoration, a right. redemption. And why was that necessary? Because of sin. Right. And so the creation mandate exists before sin. Oh. So I think in sort of the eschatology of this, the past, present, and future of the Christian life, the creation mandate stands as the intent of God's created order before sin. The Great Commission, the gospel mandate, applies to now that we're in a sinful world and you are heirs of Adam being brought to being heirs of Jesus. 
that the gospel mandate is what he wants us to do in the context of being uh, in a fallen world. And I, I think even the Great Commission is thought of too small. I hear people say all the time, okay, well, yeah, that gospel for the creation mandate or the dominion mandate or the Genesis 1 mandate, that was back before sin that we were to go kind of steward the whole world. But now we are called to save souls. And I believe in evangelism. I believe we have to present the gospel and what it means. But if we're being real honest, it doesn't say go make disciples in the nations. It says make disciples of, of the, the nations. nations. Right. And I don't believe that is just a reference to a political or civic sphere. I think it's a reference to the entirety of society, that while I want my next-door neighbor to come to a saving knowledge of the Lord, I want his family to, I want there to be whole churches, I want there to be whole neighborhoods, right. communities, cities, states, yeah. the whole enchilada, that's the Great Commission. That flows out of the creation mandate. Yeah, that makes sense. It's actually an ongoing fulfillment of it, it, it because be. we're in the sin dimension now. It's a redemptive reversal yeah. that will help us continue on with the original mission. That's a great explanation. I like that. I'm going to remember that. Number five, what is the application of your message to high school seniors and recent graduates? Yeah, the younger age is something that's very interesting to me because and I, I imagine your experience would be similar to mine here. You know, teenagers worked when, when I was a oh, teenager. Yeah. And, and there are teenagers that maybe don't want to work and there are parents that maybe don't want their teenagers to work. But there also is a public policy impediment where it's very hard for teenagers to get work because of high minimum wage laws. Oh, yeah. And this idea that, well, the person working behind the counter at McDonald's is supposed to be making a living wage. The presumption that all these types of entry-level jobs that are meant to be for lower skill, lower education, you have to have that type of work in your society. I think they're wonderful jobs for hourly part-time work for teenagers to build a little skill set, to learn how to show up on time, right. to learn how to take orders from a boss you may not like a lot, yeah. to get along with coworkers. These are life skills. How do you expect someone to show up at their first job at 25 if they didn't ever have someone bossing them around at Baskin Robbins when they were 16? And I don't get it. And I think we have to start to prize teenage employment again. I, I think it's 100% right on. And uh, having experience with employees of that nature who yeah. have never worked in high school and now work, you, they have to learn how to have a job yeah. before they can even be effective at the job. And, and that's well, the purpose of those jobs, right? It, it very much is. And and yet it also is really productive of the economy. The, um, the, the companies can't hire uh, people at a certain wage for some of those work. It's more menial, right? I used to work as an usher. It was back in the day called Edwards Movie Theater. And and I made four twenty five an hour in the late 1980s, sweeping floors and so forth. Yeah. Um, those types of things, you you end up with a worse experience in the movie theater when you have less people doing that work, but they're not going to pay someone 20 something bucks an hour. No. The margins on a lot of these, these jobs, you see the higher prices we're dealing with at fast food restaurants now. It's largely because the labor costs have gone up. They've had to invest a lot of CapEx into technology for kiosks and things. We need more teenagers working. And, and that's teenagers. I would even add, by the way, young 20s is different oh, good. than a 16-year-old. Um, most people went to college, worked a part-time job in college as a way to go through right, it. Right. Why do they not do it now? Do they not need spending money? Do they not need to go home on weekends or go home on holidays? They still need all that. It's that they're wrapping that into their student debt. And then it's being forgiven by the president. Well, or not. Or the, <laughs> but you're right. There's that, whole, there's that whole mess going on. But my point is we have over a trillion dollars of student debt. Yeah. And hundreds of billions of it was wrapped up in living expenses. Yeah. Now, look, th those monies were needed for a certain thing. But it used to be that you were working part-time at a coffee shop or a right. restaurant right. while you were then studying and doing your term paper. It was part of the experience. We're not just being deprived economically. Some of this stuff is being deprived of a sort of basic life lesson. Yeah. Well, the next one is, what's the next group is parents of young families. And, and this is probably the hardest for people. Most of us went through that stage. I, myself, when I had a young family, had not achieved the financial freedom I enjoy now. And I was a very ambitious young man, and my wife worked her tail off as a mother and a wife, and she was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. But I felt that anxiety, that pressure to provide for my family and build what I thought God wanted me to build. I had a big vision and ambition for all that. And I think that there's very little mentorship that exists right mm -hmm. now for young men trying to balance those different things. And oftentimes when they find advice, 
it is necessarily tilted towards don't be working too hard. Make sure you're home for dinner. Make sure this and that. And it's because I think that message is safe. It's easy. Mm -hmm. No one's ever going to judge you for saying the pietistic thing of be home with your kids all right. the time. Sometimes someone needs to be told, hey, it's great. You've missed, you made every soccer game. Your, your boss thinks you're mediocre. Your bo boss thinks you're slacking. Yeah. There needs to be a message that somehow involves the wisdom, the wisdom of figuring out when to leave work early, when to stay late, when to be present for your wife after a long business trip, when you know, the kids need you more. These things are not easy, but, that, but the book of Proverbs was written because some things are not easy. Right. It requires wisdom. Wow, that's really good. Really good. Number seven, application of message to the empty nesters. Kind of guys your age and a little bit older. Yeah, so not quite fully in retirement or senior years of life, but their kids are now grown, maybe out into college or out into young jobs. And oftentimes uh, people have now achieved some financial freedom. Right. They've made it. They have a little status in their work. And uh, this is where the cliche can come in about a midlife crisis. And I think we're used to from movies and from pop culture thinking, oh, a midlife crisis is when a person, a woman or a man decides to start looking at other people. It could be, uh, you know, the temptation of uh, adultery or it could be uh, something kind of silly like buying a red Ferrari. Or yeah. <laughs> you know what I think most commonly is, is people that start experiencing dissatisfaction with their career, wondering what is what does it all mean? What has it all been for? Has this all really mattered? And that point in someone's life, I, as a man, can speak a little more experientially right. to a man feeling that way. Mm -hmm. If they understand the biblical significance of the work they've done the first couple decades of their adult life, they don't have to spend the next couple decades questioning it all. That work mattered to God. You know, people can make mistakes here and there along the way. There are moments where maybe I should have been home more, I missed a thing, right. but that's part of the Christian journey. But to fully, as an empty nester, start second-guessing everything you did along the way is a really unnecessary level of guilt, and I don't think it's Christian. Yeah, I think you're right on that. And I've had multiple conversations that essentially went like this. And at that age, I feel like an ATM machine. Yeah. Everyone just wants money. In other words, there's no real satisfaction in the work itself. I don't attach this yeah. to being a way of worshiping or glorifying God. I see it as a way to provide money for everybody, and that's not very satisfying right now. No. <laughs> and I'm starting to get resentful about it. Well, and understandably so. Yeah, you do, because and, your worldview is wrong. And that's where it's interesting what you just point out is that message there is not only to the, the man or woman who's in that career point of feeling that way, but to their partner, to their spouse, to reaffirm them, to, to validate, and not just as the transactional thing of, hey, I validate your work. Thank you for providing our bills. Mm -hmm. But I validate your work. Thank you for actually being a good policeman. Thank you for being a good teacher. Thank you for being whatever you were in that vocational calling, validating the essence of the work at the home is very important. Yeah, I, I think that's a really great point. I'd love to talk more about that with uh, respect to the stay-at-home mom. Yeah. What is her role in all of this? It's hard for her to not see, to not see her work as real work. I believe it is harder work. Um, exactly. The, re the reason why we uh, bifurcate this is because of economics. It's not compensated. Right. Right. So how do I know that, you know, I, I have a big corner office job on Wall Street. How, how does, why does the world think my job is a big deal? Because I get paid a lot of money. Right. And the mom who's just crushing it, dealing with the kids and all of the things that go on, there's no paycheck. Yeah, and there's no hierarchy of respect, really. <laughs> that's right. That's right. It's very horizontal. You might have other moms that get it, and, and you meet up at the park, and you meet at coffee, and you have your hopefully moments of building community. But there's no hierarchy. Um, here, here's what I would say. My book was purposely written to focus more on vocational work. Right. There is a message I care about that's in the context more of career oriented, uh, the occupational side, but the principles, the theology, it's totally the same. Yeah. A life of productivity, a life of service, a life of activity. I've read Proverbs 31 a thousand <laughs> times. I used to read it all the time when I was single because I wanted to find a Proverbs 31 woman. Yeah. I thought the more I'd read it, the more I'd find one. Right. That doesn't look to me like a lazy stay-at-home mom watching soap operas, eating bonbons. She's running a business. She's running a business. She's running a legit business with employees. Absolutely. 
highly industrious, highly capable. Um, you know, there's even a growing uh, opportunity in what they call vocational housewives, where they're doing things at home, it, it, uh, more volunteer-oriented things. Uh, who, the point here is not the value in the marketplace. Right. The, the goods and services command a certain value in the price system. And that's an important economic idea. But when you're talking about here is God's calling for someone that is very, very important, that raising of the kids, the running of the household. Ideally, and this is something that my wife and I really worked hard on because we had a pretty traditional view of this stuff. A lot has changed in the culture. I don't have a normative thing to say about should a woman work, should a man do that. It, there, every situation is going to be different. Right. One of the things that's changed a lot of it, Pastor, as you know, is because we ended up with so many two-income households, prices all went up. Right. Houses and cars went up. So the self-fulfilling prophecy became because so many two-income families exist, now you need to be a two-income family. Or a three-income family. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, to make it. Right. And um, I, speaking of that, it's just a joke. I'll throw it out there. A very, very, very wealthy friend of mine once said he was going to get a bumper sticker made saying, legalize polygamy. I need a third <laughs> income. <laughs> um, and, and, and so there's a joke behind that right. there. But yeah, you know, I think that... Um, that that traditional understanding here must be embedded in the husband has to talk to the wife about his work, his challenges. The wife has to talk to the husband about her challenges, the stress. They have to be empathetic with one another, supportive of one another, and do this as partners. I don't think it's easy to do. I certainly have not done it perfectly, but that's the biblical model. Right. And what about the woman? I'm assuming that the message is you shouldn't feel guilty if you have a job. Well, I, of course, and I think... Working it, in the marketplace. So you have a job at home, obviously, but I yeah, mean, in but, the marketplace. But I think that that's where this idea of wisdom, and again, I, I talk like an economist a lot because I am one, uh, the macro and the micro. At a macro level, we're talking about these biblical concepts. Right. What needs to take place? At a micro level, each family situation is going to be different. I can't speak macro to every micro situation where where sometimes there's a maybe a woman might say, I want to leave the workforce for a few years and come back. I can speak to my family situation. When I met my wife, she was in a career. She had a college degree, was working at an advertising agency. She stayed working the first several years of our marriage, did well. She's a very gifted woman. And then she left the workforce as we had kids and I was in in a position financially to support our family. That's what we chose to do. Right. As our kids got older, um, I ran my own business. She ended up joining our business. Right. Now, that's a way to do things. It's not the way. So I don't think it's normative, but I think there's different ways in which a woman doesn't have to feel guilty, but each family has to solve what their priorities are and how they execute those priorities. Yeah, that sounds like a very healthy balance of approaching the whole thing. Uh, what is the application of your message to those facing retirement or in retirement today? This is a, a fun one because I think there's um, a couple things that go wrong here. The first is easiest is the idea that retirement is a 25-year vacation where you now get to return to the hedonism of your youth. Oh. J just go back to the bar, go back to the golf course. Go, No, I don't believe any Christian could justify the idea that my purpose now is a 25-year um, party. And I think we've built up and marketed entire li senior living facilities around this idea of just playing all the time. Right. I'm for leisure. I'm for recreation. I'm never for leisure and recreation, recreation becoming existential, hmm. becoming the purpose of our existence, even in senior years. And the notion of I worked hard, I paid my dues. Now I'm just on the sailboat full time. No matter how hard you worked, you didn't earn the right to escape, uh, even in our heavenly rest, which Hebrews talks about, yeah. we're going to be worshiping God in work. Right. We have some jobs to do. And so there's more uh, margin one earns throughout life. There's more vacation. There's more, you know, good times, what have you. But no, an escape from any kind of uh, usefulness is not biblical. But then there's another flaw people make. This is where I think I'm going to offend some people, and I don't ever mean to cause offense. But they say, okay, yeah, I'm done with my career. But now I'm volunteering. I go to Mexico once a year, build an orphanage. I go, oh, wow, you were in construction? They go, no, 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 I was an accountant. I go, well, why do you think your most usefulness <laughs> is going <laughs> to build an orphanage? If I went down to do it, they'd spend the whole weekend teaching me how to build something. I have right. no idea. Right. It's totally re uh, removed from our expertise and our experience. Why do we think what God wants for us in our senior years is to be removed from our expertise and experience? We, our society is craving mentorship. 
we need the 65 year olds to still be in the classrooms and factories and offices one or two days a week, consulting, advising. I mean, I can't speak to every professional application, but the point is not only do I still want people engaged and useful, but they ought to be engaged and useful in the thing they know best, right? which is probably the thing they did for 30 or 40 years. Most of their life. Yeah, exactly. Okay. I have read a, an article that this story was told in the article of a guy who was up in um, Monterey area and he saw Clint Eastwood at 88 years of old. I think he's like 91 now, but 88 years of age and he's pumping his own gas. Mm -hmm. So he walked up to him to say, why are you pumping your own gas? Yeah. And you're still building, making movies. He just made a movie in 2017. So he's around that age, right? And he said this, you never let the old man in. Yeah, that's a great line. And his, it, his point was, you stay working and you don't give up. You keep pursuing. Don't act like an old man that lays around and doesn't do anything. Well, you know what's interesting, Pastor, is that is not only true and that mentality of him at 88, I would like to say, I think there's people doing it at 38. They're starting to have this mentality of removal, of surrender. Letting the old man in and just kind of lounge it, it around. It goes down younger and younger. Ken Langone uh, was the founder, a co-founder of Home Depot. Right. It's worth about $3 billion. I've had the occasion to, to meet with him a couple of times. Uh, he's now, I don't know if he's 88. He might be 85. He's up there right. every day, puts his suit and tie on, goes, has lunch meetings, mm -hmm. you know, meet people. He's got grandkids. He's charitable, great grandkids. He's very involved, family, all that. Still suits up. And his, his explanation was the same. He goes, as soon as I get out of that routine I had when I was 40, I know what's coming next. Oh, yeah. And it's horizontal. <laughs> exactly right. Yeah. There's a great value in this yeah. understanding that work really is a way that we worship God. It's part of who he built us to be. It's, it's beautiful. Next one. How does artificial intelligence make an impact on your theology of work? Well, I think a lot of people are concerned that artificial intelligence is this new thing that's going to take away our need to work and in some cases take away the access to our ability to work. And I first want to point out to people, as a matter of fact, I don't think artificial intelligence is new. I think it, what's new is it's getting faster and getting more capable. But that all artificial intelligence is is a newest evolution of digital computing. And we, the personal computer started 50 years ago. And so we've been adding digital technological advancements ever since, nonstop, and at right. rapid speed. Right. And the internet was supposed to change all these things. The cloud is supposed to change all these things. Now it's AI. Well, first of all, those concerned that AI is going to take away um, jobs have to understand that since all this technological evolution we have created in our country, 51 million net new jobs. Wow. AI will destroy some jobs, hmm. but it will create more than it destroys. The internet, the computer, and if we want to go back to the Industrial Revolution, uh, the horse and buggy industry was decimated by the automobile. Right. And yet the out of that moment does come a reinvention of other jobs. It's pivotally important, not just theologically, but even in our economic and political and cultural understandings, that we maintain a devotion to labor dynamism, being dynamic, being flexible. We might have to learn new skills. Right. We might even have to move. See, people used to do that all the time. Like, there's a good opportunity. I got to uproot or move into this other place. You may have to do that. May, you, the, each situation is going to be different. But what I believe theologically I want to share is that AI cannot replace the human things. There are things a computer cannot do because God made them only to be done by humans. The really human things involved in a personal <laughs> relationship. If you're doing counseling as a pastor, you may be able to have AI generate certain kind of things to read, but there's nothing like just sitting down with someone who feels you, talks to you, who, who knows you. The, the human things are irreplaceable in the job market, and I will pay a premium as an employer for virtue. Oh, yeah. AI exactly. cannot create virtue. No. And often programmed against it. And, and that's right. But no matter what it is, uh, AI, code, web, internet, social media, all it is is amoral that can either right. be used by the person programming it for good or for evil. Exactly. Exactly. Number 11 here. What would you uh, have a message for someone who's presently unemployed, especially with respect to the devastating emotional effects that that circumstance creates. You talk about it in the first few chapters of your book. Yeah. 
I think that in a lot of ways, people finding work and finding purpose can be therapeutic to other devastations and traumas they've suffered in life. And then sometimes people losing jobs can create the devastation and traumas that one is struggling with in life. And that was very, very true in the Great Depression. Men were losing the job and they were embarrassed to have lost it. They were ashamed. They were, and they felt their self esteem, self worth was hurting. One of the things that I think has just become very practical in a society that has 9 million unfilled jobs, less than 4 million people looking for jobs, and an unemployment rate of about 3.6, 3.7%. Um, that doesn't mean every single person looking for a job will find one tomorrow, because some of the jobs that are unfilled, are there's a huge disconnect with the skill set. They're not, you know, you could say, well, I'm unemployed, I was a waiter, and there's a job opening for a welder with an advanced degree in certain science or engineering. Yeah. You know, okay, so there's a disconnect there. But you know what I believe I would do if I were unemployed in 25 or 35 and without this, you know, career in finance? I would make finding a job my job. Yeah. I would wake up and put a tie on. And I would sit down, and I have the computer and the, oh, and the same way you go about your work every day, that you're set scheduling appointments, you're thinking through things, you're reading, you're researching, you take a posture of proactivity. Even and dressing the part. Even dressing the part, yeah. acting the part. I, uh, by the way, uh, this in, in, in presupposes someone has the financial wherewithal to do this, which most people wouldn't. But I've talked to middle-aged men who have a little money that lost their job and were really down and out. They've gone and rented a little part-time office to go find a job. Oh, smart. It becomes like a place to yeah. sort of get into that mode. Now, that's not going to work for people with, without yeah, yeah. the economic means and all that, but it's a mentality. Yeah. And um, I do not believe people stay without a job when they make finding a job their job. That's great. Great advice. Our last question. Mm. It seems to me that your book has some meaningful parallels with Abraham Kuyper. And his view of cultural engagement, could you explain to our audience that connection? Well, you know, I am a, a deeply committed Protestant reformer. I was heavily influenced by the great John Calvin, and I think Abraham Kuyper was an heir of Calvin. And what I mean by that is not about certain theological things, not about what we call soteriology. It's about the biblical worldview. I think Calvin was a real, true worldview theologian. And Kuyper in the late 19th century and into the early 20th became the prime minister of Holland. He was the uh, sort of CEO of the newspaper right. of Holland, and he was one of the most brilliant uh, theologians and academic professors. He taught this notion of what they call sphere sovereignty, that we exist in a sphere as an individual, that's separate from the sphere we exist in in family, and then in church, and in state. And that all of these things matter to God as different spheres of the kingdom of God. But our responsibility as a father is different than our responsibility as a worker, but we have both different applications. Yeah. Kuyper believed that all of what we do was under the lordship of Christ. So he lived that because he was such an incredibly gifted multitasker in media and in politics and in academia and in the church. Didn't he start a university he too? Did. Yeah, in Amsterdam. <laughs> I don't really um, do that much. And, and again, when I say Eric Calvin, I just went to Geneva, Switzerland, and my family that recently. Calvin had started a hospital and a university. <laughs> the school's still there today. And just in his spare time, wrote thousands of pages right. of the best Christian theology ever written. So, you know, it, the, these guys were hard workers. But what drove it was Kuiper's theological commitment to a world and life view of Christianity. I believe that a Christian has to be saved, that there is a point of regeneration, of conversion, but I do not believe that the entire gospel is about that person being saved. I believe the entire gospel is about God redeeming creation to himself. This is what I mean by the lordship, that, that it was largely Kuiper who really taught me about this. I think God cares about church, family, and media, and technology, right. and sciences, and finance. Yeah. All of the above. That's a very Kuyperian idea. And the sooner we get Christians of influence in those areas yeah. doing work for the glory of God, that will be, as I think you mentioned even in your message, your third message this weekend, and thank you for that third message, yeah. uh, is that'll have the greatest impact on our culture and recapturing it and bringing it back, hopefully, to the grounding principles. Absolutely. There's leverage. There's yeah. leverage in it. 
you have a lot of operating leverage as someone engaged in the Great Commission and the cultural mandate when you have these types of positions throughout different spheres of society. The alternative would be let the world take, this is the old Leninist idea of commanding heights of culture, let the world take Hollywood, Wall Street, higher education, all the Ivy League, Washington, D.C., Sacramento, and we'll hold on to some churches and a couple Bible colleges. And we'll see what happens to the culture. Yeah, we're kind of living it. It didn't go very well. No, it's not going well. My last question then, he just came to mind, and that is this. Outside of your book, what is a book that you would recommend that either discusses mm. Kuiper's theories or is written by Kuiper? Oh, well, that, that's a great question. So not just another work, book on work, but another book on Kuiperian thought. You know, a guy, Richard Mao, wrote a book called Kuiper, it was a biography of Kuiper, but it's really a very easy to read, very digestible summary of Kuiperian thought. Um, and I think that Mao's book on Kuiper is a wonderful introduction there. Book, Kuiper himself, uh, you know, it, you get into some heavier uh, stuff, but his lectures he gave at Princeton Seminary in the late 19th century are just some of the most beautiful things I've ever read in my life. Wow. And so there's quite a, a wide orbit of things. There's a book, too, called Every Thought Captive by um, uh, Matt's, by Richard, uh, excuse me, by um, Richard Pratt. Spell Every, the last name? P-R-A-T-T. -T. Oh, Every Pratt. Thought Captive. Okay. And it really lays out a sort of Kuiperian vision for how we think as Christians. Oh, cool. So that, you know, whenever someone else says what's well, one particular book, it's, it's hard. It's tough for me because it's, yeah, there's so many good ones out there. But, but Kuiperian thought is not just out of Kuiper. I mean, like he was uh, Era Calvin, his uh, co-worker Herman Bavink has really oh, uh, influenced right. me. And his books are called Reform Dogmatics, but it's for real serious, heavy-duty stuff. Those are real serious, deep end of the pool reads too. But then today we're blessed in this state, 2023, there's a lot of really readable books that are more modern. Tim Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor, mm. is very Kuiperian. But it's a real easy to read understanding of Christian work and, and a Kuyperian interpretation of these endeavors we go through in our life. And so even though Kuyper didn't write it, he influenced it. Great. What I really enjoyed about your bike, book, and one of the reasons I would recommend it, more than one, the first thing that hit me is when I ride my bike and I'm riding with guys that are mostly retired, they're always got these visions, I'm going to be retired, I can't wait. And I, I'm saying to myself, yeah, I hear the next sentence, I'm going to get a motorhome and I'm going to travel the United States and I'm going to cruise around. And and uh, every one of these guys, they do that. And I know it, it, the story ends the same. Number one, their wife never wanted to do that. She just reluctantly agreed. She wants to be at home with the grandkids and doing and being with their friends. Number two, he realizes he has a half a million dollar white elephant yeah. <laughs> parked somewhere that has to be maintained and no one wants to drive it with him. Yeah. And his wife is basically giving him the message. If you want to do that again, just tell me where the f first hotel is that yeah. you can uh, meet me at. Exactly. And that's where I'll be. And then number four, he realizes his life has zero purpose. Yeah. And he's starting to wonder, what in the heck am I going to do? And so I usually ask him this question. I say, so what are you going to do with the next 20, 25 years that you have left now that you're retired? And they give me the blank sp spare, you know, deal after the motor home or travel or whatever. And I would say, then what, what else? Yeah. And it's it, your book answers that. Yeah. It answers it in crystal clear language, which is the purpose of your work is in itself self-fulfilling when it's done for the glory of God. Yeah. And you will find meaning even in your older years, in your retirement years, by using the gifts and talents you've used and sharpened for 40 years in the workplace to be able to expand God's kingdom, whether you're mentoring in a secular school or a secular business environment, or you're doing it at church with young men who are Christians who wanna know how to do what you did in business so that they can do the same thing. So that book is great uh, for that reason. Another reason is the first two chapters, if you have any involvement in the general public and wanna understand the psyche of what's going on, you have well documented the angst of our culture today and attributed it to this missing link in our understanding, even in the secular world, that work has inherent value because we were designed by God to work. It's part of what it means to be a human being. And all of that documented angst was really impactful. And I just go, wow, this answers a lot of questions everyone's asking 
but no one really has a satisfactory answer to. So that would be the second reason I'd rec recommend the book. And then the third reason that I would recommend the book is because I like your writing style. <laughs> it's enjoyable, easy read with tough concepts. So I can highly recommend the book and encourage people to get it and read it. If anyone wants to follow up, follow your career, follow what you're doing, uh, be involved with you in any way, how do they get a hold of you? How can they find out more about you? Um, so Bonson.com, B-A-H-N-S-E-N, it houses everything. From there, they'll get the website to the book, which is fulltimebook.com. But then the podcast I do, the investment, economics work I do, the, it's all kind of housed under bonson.com. And I'm, I'm trying to stay involved with the Christian school, with economics and finance. This book, we just use bonson.com as sort of the home base Great. for all that material. You're doing two podcasts. Yeah. Tell us about each one. Give us a summary of each real quick so that we can tune into those. I find them really great. I enjoy them. Well, even you. when you get into the, the in, even in the bonds, you talked about bonds and I enjoyed it very much. Yes. Yeah, so if you can make bonds uh, interesting, then maybe you're doing something <laughs> okay. But um, one is the one you're referring to, uh, National Review's Capital Record. Capital Record, so right. So Capital Record is a weekly podcast and it exists for the purpose of me trying to defend free enterprise defend free enterprise as a means to a free and virtuous society. And so it can be economic, it could be uh, financial, it can be philosophical, uh, but I bring guests on every right. week and it's me and a guest doing something in the range of why we believe this defense of free enterprise is very needed and I'm doing this from my distinctly Christian worldview. And then Dividend Cafe is my real just investment commentary. What's happening in the market? What's happening in the economy? Yes, yeah, stocks, bonds, all of that good stuff. And so Dividend Cafe is the other one we've done for years as well. And both I, I pour my heart into, believe in them a lot, and uh, they're different from one another, but I think they both scratch a certain niche. That's great. Right. Good. All right. Well, thank you very much, David. It's great to have you with us. I appreciate your time both speaking at the church today and last night and doing this podcast with us. Thanks so much for having me. All right. God bless. God bless.